Okay, so um, thanks. Um, a couple of, first of all, I, I teach postgraduate papers on this, so we're trying to squash in to 30, 45 minutes a whole lot of information. The next apology is that I'm a bit obsessional, and so, <laughs> but my slides are crowded. The reason the slides are crowded, I like to back up what I'm saying. We won't get through it all, but you all have access to those slides. So if you're tempted to think, this guy's talking rubbish, then you can look at the slides later and set, get some documentation validation for what I'm saying, okay? So don't be put off by the crowded slides. I'm not, not going to be tested on afterwards, but there's a few key thoughts to come out here. Um, okay, so pharmacotherapy for chronic pain. So the first thing is this, and I'm going to, I'm going to um, justify this statement in, the middle, in a minute, but analgesics have a very limited role. Okay, that, um, and what I say to patients, that's why you're in a pain management centre. If we had medications that were effective, we would need to employ physios and clinical psychologists and nurses and occupational therapists. We just give you effective treatment and you'd be on your way, living your life. The fact that we have complex uh, services for complex patients means that we don't have effective biomedical <coughs> treatment. The fact that low back pain and headache are the leading cause of disability worldwide means that we do not have effective biomedical treatment. Sounds obvious, but it's very easy to forget that in day-to-day -day life with a patient there who's expecting you to come up with a miracle cure. Now, we don't have magic wands. Um, okay, so, so just to back up that statement. So these are, these are some re review articles. This is in a rheumatology journal that looked at treatments for non-specific for non low back pain, chronic low back pain. They found, they found adequate published studies to, to review about 36 different treatments for low back pain. So the first conclusion, there's 36 different treatments available that have been studied. There's nothing that's particularly effective. Uh, and the next thing is half of those were found to be effective. 18 of those 36 were effective. But the effect of them, those that were effective was small. Okay? That's Rheumatology Journal 2009. Um, a neurology journal, 2013, a common finding in the literature on these interventions for chronic low back pain is a disappointing magnitude of pain reduction and gain in functionality. So it's not just you who are failing, it's the medications aren't good enough. And this is from an um, anaesthesia journal, 2010, who these people reviewed all the new analgesics that have been released onto the market worldwide in the last 50 years, 1960 to 2009. And there was only one new class of analgesics on the market in 50 years. Anyone know what it is? Triptans. Triptans was the only new class of medication. Every other new analgesic introduced over those 50 years was a Me Too drug, which was a modified opioid or a modified non-steroidal. Okay. And what they found, it's very intense research efforts directed at diverse molecular targets related to pain mechanisms produced thousands of publications. <laughs> but those efforts had not yet yielded new analgesics with sufficient effectiveness. And their review highlighted the lack of real breakthroughs in analgesic drug development, despite intensive research. It's not that there's no research going on. It's that the research efforts have been futile. They have failed. They typically work in animal models, but when you do clinical trials in humans, they fail. Almost, in fact, universal except for triptans. Okay. Uh, and this is in a Nature Medicine review in November 2010. Um, sobering comment, but here we go. Most existing analgesics for persistent pain are relatively ineffective. The number of patients who need to be treated to achieve 50% pain reduction in neuropathic pain in one patient is more than four. So the chances, if a patient comes into you with neuropathic pain, the chances you're going to be even, not abolish their pain, but even reduce it by 50% is less than one in four. Okay? So this should be comforting to you. You should all <laughs> not lose sleep about this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This, should, this, this is good news. You don't have to think, oh, I'm failing. There's something that I'm missing here. I'm a lousy doctor or, or whatever. Because this is normal. It's normal for treatments not to work. Okay? Nothing wrong with you or your clinical skills. It's the, we don't have the tools in the toolkit that are effective. Okay, and this is a, a pain last year review of treatments for low back pain. In terms of biomedical treatments to reduce pain intensity in low back pain, if one were to review, and this is a quote, these are all quotes, if one were to review effective 
treatment for back pain, the picture would be large, but perhaps somewhat underwhelming. There is now a massive body of randomised controlled trials, systematic reviews, meta-analyses of treatments for back pain, treatments that do exist regardless of the discipline that offers them, regardless of their provenance, how they developed, offer on average a small benefit or no benefit at all, aside from the non-specific benefits of treatment. In other words, the therapeutic relationship. Um, so they offer little actual therapeutic effect themselves. Okay, so that's the bad news. So, so what is worth trying? As I said, no magic wands. Um, so this is, this, in terms of pain of papers, there's a couple of papers here that are really key, and this is one of them. This was published in Lancet Neurology in February 2015. It's the most recent guidelines on the pharmacological treatment of neuropathic pain. Um, so this is their first line treatments, strong recommendations. So one, try cyclic antidepressants. Now when you look at that, the dose is 25 to 150 milligrams. Now the doses down there, those are the doses at which the clinical trials show <laughs> that the active drug is more effective than the placebo. So, so if you look at gabapentin, 1,200 to 3,600 milligrams a day. Those are the doses found to be more effective than placebo. So if someone's tried 100 milligrams gabapentin at night, they haven't failed a trial of gabapentin. They haven't even tried gabapentin adequately. Okay? Similarly with pre gabapentin 300 to 600, venlafaxine 150 to 225. It's got to be 150 or more if you're going to have any chance of being more effective than placebo. <coughs> so, so there's basically two lots. One is gabapentinoid gabapentin. Uh, gabapentinoid anticonvulsants, and the other one is noradrenergic antidepressants, SNRIs and tricyclics. It, you require a noradrenergic effect of an antidepressant for it to be effective in pain. That's why SSRIs aren't there. You need a noradrenergic effect to increase synaptic levels of noradrenaline. Um, now look at the number needed to treat. This is depressing stuff. Tricyclics is about 3.6. got to treat somewhere between three and four patients before you get one patient to get a 50% or more reduction in their pain. But wait on, it gets worse. Gabapentinoids, seven. You've got to treat seven to eight patients before one patient will have a 50% or more reduction in their pain. And SNRIs, 6.4. Bit of good news this month, pre gabalin as of 1st of May this year, is funded, and we don't have to go through the charade of getting um, special authority funding for gabapentin anymore. So these are, these. Are, in fact, that's from the 1st of June, I think, gabapentin. But 1st of May, we can now prescribe to <coughs> gabapentin. So that's it. Now, when you look at that list, several things. One, these were drugs developed for other conditions. <laughs> They're not analgesics. They were found serendipitously to be effective for pain. Again, that speaks to the failure of attempts to find effective analgesics. The next thing when you look at that list is what's not there. What's not there? Paracetamol's not there. Okay? Useless. So again, non steroidals aren't there. There's no benefit in chronic, chronic pain. In nociplastic pain, anti-inflammatory and paracetamol have no effect. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to get a context on your neuropathic pain you're talking is, is that in the strictest definition of neuropathic yeah, pain? Yeah, yeah, that, that's strictly so defined. So actually a pathology of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that's a really good question. These studies are essentially, and this is another problem we've got, these studies are essentially done on two forms of peripheral neuropathic pain, diabetic, painful peripheral neuropathy and post neuralgia. That's where the evidence base is. So when we come to treat central neuropathic pain like spinal cord injury pain, radicular pain, uh, MS-related pain, we are working in an evidence vacuum. Mm. We are extrapolating from the data on two forms of peripheral neuropathic pain. Because I'm thinking of, I mean, my population is cancer-related. Yeah. Although I come here because we're increasing having a lot more yeah. patients, but neuropathic pain certainly is Called cancer related nerve damage pain, and some of these engines are quite, you know, quite useful. Define it useful, okay, okay. Yeah, so, so, that, so that's why I just wanted so, to. So, so yeah. that may be because of the therapeutic relationship with you. The most powerful analogy we have yeah. is the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. Well, we could do a trial on placebo. <laughs> 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 placebo yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. we get with our patients better results than that would suggest, oh, yeah. and that's presumably the placebo, it's the therapeutic relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mood as well. That's right. Yeah. 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 
and gabapentin sleep. Yeah. And directly. Sleep, yeah. that's right, that's right. Tricyclics. Yeah. yeah. So second line treatment, so this is interesting. So first of all, um, tramadol, 200, 400 milligrams. Number need to treat 4.7. Lignocaine, we don't have any of these in New Zealand. Lignocaine, 5% patch, uh, and capsaicin, 80%, 8% patch. Uh, these are both second line treatments for specific form of neuropathic pain. Um, again, see what's not there. Paracetamol's not there, anti-inflammatories aren't there, strong opioids aren't there. Okay, so we've got to go into third line treatments. Weak recommendation for third line treatments. So strong, there we are, strong opioids. Uh, now let's just talk about that for a minute. So um, the dose that's most effective in, in trials of neuropathic pain um, is, is 180 milligrams morphine equivalent. Number need to treat 4.3. Now, in opioids, they, looked at, they found 13 trials, adequate quality, to justify inclusion in this systematic review in peripheral neuropathic pain. The doses of oxycodone used were 10 to 120 milligrams daily, and in morphine, 90 to 240 milligrams daily. Now, of those 13 trials, 10, whoopsie, sorry, done again. 10 of the 13 were positive. The maximum effectiveness was at 180 milligrams of morphine equivalent daily. Okay, so why, in the first iteration of these guidelines in 2004, morphine was first, strong opioids were first line treatment. Second iteration, 2007, they were second line treatment. In the, in the third iteration, 2015, they're third line treatment. They're being continually demoted, and the reason for that is their abuse potential and deaths. Um, they have a reasonable number needs to treat, not as good as tricyclics, about the same as tramadol, but they make third line because of the abuse potential. And look at the doses, 180 milligrams a day. It's a very high dose. Um, recommendations against, weak recommendations against cannabinoids. That's very odd. They mustn't be listening to the news. But everyone in the news and all the talkback radios and everyone else knows that cannabinoids are effective. So these people aren't up to date. Uh, but we'll come back to cannabinoids lately. And the reason that cannabinoids are weakly recommended against in the current neuropathic pain guidelines, quote, negative results, potential misuse, diversion, long-term mental health risks. Again, no one in the general population knows that. Um, principle of medication combination, as we do for hypertension, as we do for asthma. So one medication is not effective, so you combine it with other ones. And there have been a few trials published with positive results. So several trials have combined a tricyclic with a gabapentinoid. Uh, several trial, uh, trials have combined an SNRI with a gabapentinoid. And some have combined an opioid with a gabapentin or with nortriptyline. And combination analgesics for chronic pain have been reviewed in these journals there. I'll just show you what the, what the results look like. That, oh, First of all, those, those all show positive effect. In other words, these all show that the combination is better than the individual drug. Okay? And here's an example. This is the paper, again, in peripheral neuropathic pain, post hepatic neuralgia, painful diabetic neuropathy. This was in The Lancet in, in September 2009, where they com there's a baseline pain. Of those randomised to nortriptyline, there's the pain. Those randomised to gabapentin, but those randomised to the combination. Slightly better than either of those, see? That, that, that's the gain you get. But the doses used in that combination were lower. So there's the dosage of nortriptyline in the combination compared to nortriptyline as a single dose. And in the combination, there's the dose of gabapentin on average, and there's the dose of gabapentin used when it was a sole agent. So by combining them, you get a slightly better analgesic effect at slightly lower doses of each. And that's what the other trials all show. So there's some advantage to combining analgesic from different classes. But it's not a great, you know, it's not, we're not talking magic wands here. Now this is the second article that's well, you know, if, if you knew this article, it's all you need to know to manage chronic pain in terms of medical, mani medical management, sorry. <laughs> medical management. And it's published in um, British Medical Journal in June 2013, the print edition came out, and it's called Expect Analgesic failure, pursue analgesic success. The lead author, Andrew Moore, is a, um, he runs the clinical trials unit analgesics at Oxford. He's the, he's the guru on all this sort of stuff. Um, and this is a wonderful article. And I'll, I'll just run through some of the points that they, he's, he's, some other reviews by him are, are down there. 
Um, I'll just run through this, some of the points he made. The first thing the article did, is just what we've looked at. He, they, re, they reviewed published trials of adequate quality in four different sorts of pain conditions. See, how many analgesics in the published trials are effective? In other words, how many result in 50% or more pain reduction in 50% or more patients, okay? Not 100% re abolition of pain in 100% patients. Is a class is successful if they lower pain by at least 50% in at least 50% of patients. First thought they looked at was acute post-operative pain. Surprisingly, only four of 10 analgesic combinations they looked at managed to achieve a 50% or more pain reduction in acute post-operative pain. But wait, it gets worse. One in six in acute migraine, and it gets, it gets even worse here. Chronic musculoskeletal pain, none of 19 medications met that criteria. It's just what we've been talking about before. But there's more, this is more published evidence. Osteoarthritis, low back pain, fibromyalgia, and spine. And neuropathic pain, none of nine medications. Again, it's what we expect from what we've, we've reviewed so far. Just more evi evidence of the same. Medications usually fail. The title of the article is called Expect Analgesic Failure. <laughs> okay? Expect Analgesic Failure. Don't expect them to work, because they won't. John will wind up soon, so okay. So the next point that this article makes, and this is a, a really important point, analgesia is not normally distributed. You find out this by going back to the original data in the published studies and you don't look at the effect size or the overall effect size, you go back to individual patient responses, okay? And what you do when you find that is that, again, quoting the other, pain relief is not normally distributed, but usually bimodal. Very good, some people get more than 50% pain reduction, or poor. Some people get less than 15% pain reduction. Any analgesic tends to be either work quite well in a, small, in a small minority of patients, the lucky few, or not work at all. And here's an example, the, the, the um, table he gives at the end of this article is, a, is, from, a, is a, from a trial of 200 patients randomised to pregabalin 450 milligrams daily for fibromyalgia. And when you look at that graph, you can see graphically illustrated what he's talking about. So every line is an individual. Look at this poor bugger. Started off at 100 over 100 pain, ended up after, after um, 14 weeks on pre with 100 over 100 pain. Okay? This is not working, is it? <laughs> but if we see him in our service, you can bet your bottom dollar. He'll still be on pre even though it's not done anything for his pain. But when you look at these people down here, these are the lucky minority. Look at this person, up from about 95 down to about... 35 pain. This is really successful in this person. So these people here, look at those lines. Really good. But all these people, abysmal failure. Okay? Bimodal response to analgesics. <laughs> so the, the name of the game is you try and see. Um, like uh, Dr. Seuss's book, uh, I Am Sam, Sam I Am. <laughs> try it, try it. You might like it. You know. <laughs> so if, you, if, if it works, it'll work really well. Yeah? Do you need three months? No, we'll get, on, you, we'll get on to that. You don't need three months, but we'll, we'll, we'll get on to that. Good question. So if it works well, you stay on it. If it doesn't work well, you stop it. Now, that's the next point they make. Um, so respond as a minority is often achieved, here you go, often achieved within the first two weeks or so of treatment, or not at all. And this is the good news, it tends to last. It's not like an opioid or a benzo where the effect wears off. If they, the evidence is, if they respond, it tends to last. This is really good news. And those who get better, this is next bit of good news, that lucky minority who get better do well. People who respond experience improvements not only in pain, but fatigue, depression, sleep, general measures of function and quality of life, including ability to work. This is the good news. The bad news is non-responders have none of these benefits. Okay? Very unjust world, you know? Some people get all the luck and some people don't. What do you say within the first two weeks there? Are you talking about once you titrate that too? Well, exactly. Once you get to an effective yeah. dose, absolutely. That's right. Thank you. Good question. Um, now, the advantage of this, this is another important point this article makes. You minimise side effects. This respo whoopsie, responder analysis is that you, by assessing the evidence of the efficacy of the, this drug in this patient, <laughs> yes or no, bleedingly obvious. Either they come in with a big smile or they say, oh, this one's failed as well. You know, it's really obvious. The advantage of that is that in the likely event of analgesic trial failure, Patients without benefits should be exposed to no risk. Why? Because you don't keep them on the stuff. 
<laughs> okay? You have to get them off it. Because this drug is stopped, only effective drugs should continue to be prescribed. On the other hand, with success, considerable benefits in terms of pain relief, sleep, fatigue, depression, function, quality of life are balanced against the risk of serious harm. Okay? So the cost benefit swings into terms of using the drug if the bloody thing's effective. If it's not effective, why do you keep them on it? We see patients come in on five or six different drugs in, in severe pain. Conclusion, it's not working. Therefore, why are you still on it? So deprescribing is one of the things we do. Get them off ineffective medication. Yeah? Sorry. Have they done any, when did you say respond analysis, they looked at some of the factors that might contribute to... No, these, these trials didn't do that. These, right. these trials. But, um, no, they, they've gone back to non steroidal trials right back to the 1930s. They've gone back to the manufacturer and, and looked at the actual individual... And this pattern is constant, bimodal response. Most, some people respond, and, but they haven't looked at why that is. The question I had just, bef just before, just when we stopped for lunch, was about um, needles and how effective needles are. Now, this might deviate a little bit onto placebo and nocebo effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't actually explicitly covered it. So, needles. There's a, the next, there's a neurosurgeon who's an ex-president of the International Association of Study of Pain. His name is John Lucia, and he points out that a needle has two ends. There's a sharp bit that goes into the patient, and there's the blunt bit that's onto a white coat. So, so there's a strong placebo effect with any sort of injection. The next thing about placebos is, as I said, they're probably the, one of the strongest um, treatments we've got. And there have now been five published randomised trials of what they call open placebos. This is when the patient is told We've got a drug here, well, it's a little, and it's labelled placebo, inactive medication. And patients are given this, and they're explained carefully, you have to take it one twice a day. You must take it one twice a day. But it's an inactive tablet. Um, it's chemically inert. But some people, and this is quite true, some people find this really useful. And when these trials have been published, the first one in 2008 on irritable bowel syndrome, at the end of 2015, there was one on chronic low back pain, they, and some of them for non-pain conditions like psychological problems. They have all been shown to be better than no treatment. So then the question comes out: What about open placebo? Now this is this is valid. If you, you know, we have evidence that if if you give a patient a tablet that's labelled placebo, and it actually is a placebo, and you explain all this to the patient, but you have to say. You must use it twice a day, use it as directed, and you explain to the patient there's no known chemical effect of this, which is good, you say, because you're not getting any side effects because it's inert. Because <laughs> uh, when you talk to patients, the biggest problem they have with medications is fear of side effects. So if you say to them, there's no side effect with this, and it's an inert medication, some people will continue taking it uh, and, and get benefit from it. The trial in Portugal published in pain on low back pain when the trial was finished, there were a whole lot of disgruntled patients who were annoyed that their placebo was stopped. So they had to keep being prescribed, their, their, and these people are still happily taking. So he, this is a really good way. Uh, there's some evidence base to use open placebo. Okay? When it comes to the nocebo effect, which is the other side of the coin, which, which plagues our patients, uh, our patients who will get side effects on a sub-therapeutic dose, almost a homeopathic dose, but also chronic pain patients get placebo or get nocebo effects. They get side effects on the placebo arms mm -hmm. of randomised trials. So several systematic reviews have been published of this where they've looked at the placebo arms of trials. One was on migraine and one was on fibromyalgia. Now when you, when you, did, when you look at the people who are randomised to placebos on migraine, they got a high rate of side effects, but the side effect they got was reflective of the active drug it was being compared to. If it was being compared to a, a beta blocker, they got beta blocker side effects. If it was being compared to an anticonvulsant, they got the anticonvulsant side effects. And a trial of the placebo arm of, uh, I'm sorry, a systematic review of the placebo arm of trials in fibromyalgia found that 60%, I'll say it again, 60% of patients randomised to the placebo arm reported side effects. And it was sufficiently severe in 10% of them to withdraw from the trial. <laughs> so placebo effects are a real, real issue. Now that, I'm sorry, no placebo effects. So the issue comes up, how do you deal with this, especially in the age of the internet? 
And one way you can deal with this is you say to the patient, we know that in chronic pain, and pay people in general, the nocebo effect is, is a real issue and it may stop you having a potentially effective medication. Now, if you look at this stuff up on the internet or if you read the insert in the package, we know factually you are more likely to get the side effects you see on the internet. If you were wise, you would not read the insert and you would not look it up on the internet. Because if you do, you're likely to get the side effects. So you can warn, and this is, this, therefore the patient has given informed consent not to be warned about the side effects. So you get around the problem of informed consent by, by warning them of, of this. Uh, they look it up, I'm not going to tell you the side effect, but if you do, you're likely to get them, and they'll put you off taking it. And an example of that is, is um, there was a, a review published of um, statins and myalgia. It was published in the European Journal of Cardiology uh, in 2012, and Ben Goldacre was one of the co-authors. And what they found was that the incidence of myalgia in statins, those randomised to statins in all the many trials of statins, was 18%. And the incidence of myalgia in those randomised to placebo was 18%. So what this means is by warning everyone who starts on statins that you're likely to get myalgia, people are put off taking their statins, and there's probably deaths associated from that. Because people don't take an effective medication because they've got a nocebo side effect. So there's no doubt that, that statins cause myopathy occasionally, but there's no evidence they actually cause muscle aches and pains in the absence of, you know, with a normal CK and, and everything else. Anyway, so, so nocebo and placebo, really, really important in, in, in chronic pain. Now we get on to um, opioids. Um, so opioids have a limited role in, in chronic pain. So first of all, there's a lack of evidence of long-term efficacy in chronic pain. But that applies to all the medications. All the trials of medications are short-term. So that's no different in, in opioids. But there's also other problems, tolerance and physiological dependence, risk of accidental overdoses, and we've all heard of the US opioid epidemic or crisis. Uh, huge, huge public health problem. Uh, being called the biggest public health problem in America's history. Um, Substance use disorder, and we mustn't forget, there is this thing called substance use disorder. So people who feel much better on an opioid may be people who've got a, an opioid use disorder. They're going to feel a hell of a lot better on, on regular opioids. There's also the issue of opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Not everyone, but some people on regular long-term opioids, their pain threshold lowers. So you've got to do less stimulus, less intense stimulus, to cause them to feel pain. And in experimental animals, intraperitoneal injections of remifentanil um, uh, lab mice, within four hours, their, their pain threshold is lowered. So that it requires less stimulus to cause pain. So paradoxically, long-term opioids can actually worsen pain. And we'll come up to that in a minute when we talk about getting people off opioids. Uh, and then there's the issue of, of withdrawal effects if people suddenly stop opioids. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why um, opioids don't have an established role. Now we've had at Burwood, we've had opioid guidelines drawn up by an anaesthetist. Uh, we've been using the same ones that were brought in in 1999. That was the second edition. We felt no need to change them. There's basically four principles. First of all, it, we don't normally use strong opioids for chronic non cancer. It's not a normal part of it, it's not evidence based, guideline based treatment. Two, if we do, it's normally methadone. Now, that's the one that's most likely to be challenged. It's probably buprenorphine is probably better, but it's not funded. Um, but, and also the whole issue that's come up in the last 20 years of the prolonged QS, um, uh, QT in, in, in methadone. Uh, third principle, we, we never prescribe the first visit. Uh, we initiate opioids only after discussion at the weekly case conference. Now that's really important. So first of all, the patient comes in and they've come from another city, what well, variety of your cities, <laughs> and they come down to us and we have no records about them and they turn up and want to be prescribed opioids. They say, well look, it's our policy of our service, I can't give them to you today, we're going to discuss it. That's the first thing, it saves you being put on the spot, you can blame the policy. <laughs> and, the sec and the second thing is, uh, you share the uh, res re response with your team. So when you write back, you say, we've discussed at our team case conference and we do not think, or we do think, that opioids are indicated in this patient. Okay, so really important for never prescribe, so we don't prescribe at the first visit. Fourthly, and this is an absolute important message, we do not endorse the prescription of opioids for patients 
with a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. It's a no-no. Bang! Um, you just don't do it. If it, someone's got a substance use disorder, even if it's not opioids, if, if it's a substance use disorder, we do not engage in discussions about opioids, doses. They only want to talk about milligrams of morphine. We don't go there. Uh, that's up to an alcohol and drug service. Yeah? Could you just flesh out substance use disorder a little bit? Say again? Could you just flesh out substance use disorder? I'm not a psychiatrist. We got, I think we've got a psychiatrist in the audience. Did someone say that? Yeah, yeah. You want to flesh out substance use disorder? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the spot. Uh, So, so it's the old word for addiction. I mean, it's a new word for addiction. So someone's got an addiction, addicted of some sort. Um, we, we don't, that's up to alcohol and drug services who all their opioid or benzodiazepine prescribing. All we get engaged in is in fact all we do anyway. Well, we don't use opioids. So pa patient, people who are addicts think that we're discriminating against them because we won't give them opioids. We say, now hang on, we don't give anyone opioids. It's not normally part of the treatment of chronic pain. What we offer most of our, in fact, our patients is non-opioid pharmacotherapy, we've discussed that, and non-pharmacological pain management. So we're not discriminating against opioid addicts. They think we are. But we say, no, we're not going there. You, you can get your opioids through an opioid substitution program. John, do you want to just talk on um, combined care with cats as well? Yeah, so, so we have, for 20 years now, I've been attending a regular monthly meeting with our alcohol and drug service, where we, can, we had one on Monday, two days ago, um, we discussed five patients who are joint um, patients of alcohol and drugs and, and of us. And we come up with a combined uh, management approach. And it normally is exact, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more of the same. We, we say virtually with everyone, look, we establish with the alcohol and drug service, this person is known to your service, yep, they say, uh, been there for 20 years. This person has polysubstance abuse. Uh, and uh, then we agree that their opioid medications will be under control of alcohol and drugs. We have nothing to do with that. And we don't see them, if they're an uncontrolled, untreated opioid addiction, we don't see them until they've been re-engaged with CADS and have got their substance use under, under control. And it's really helpful in a GP referral when we do the triage, if the GP referral says has been coming in and asking for dot, 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 or if there's some kind of indication around a substance use disorder, that information helps us right at the gateway to the service to maybe put them on the list to discuss. Um, so any kind of warning sign you can put out in those referrals is really useful. Yeah. And it also solves the conflict about do you believe the person with a substance use disorder, are they, in, are they do they have persistent pain, right? Because we don't know. And so, CADs, they can still get the opioids under CADs. You can give them the benefit of the doubt, but it's controlled. And, and, and so the other thing about you know, how do you flesh out substance use disorder, in my simple brain, it's pursuing that drug over and above everything else in their lives to, the, to their health detriment, and they won't take advice, etc. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're pretty clear, and one of the big things that we feel strongly about is that we don't abandon them, so we offer them we offer them an appointment with the uh, psychiatrist, you know, etc. So that they're not abandoned. We don't reject them out of hand, but we do recognise that we can't treat their chronic pain problem when they've got this disorder at the same time. Yeah. 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 <coughs> um, okay. So if if we 
And it happened in, in the 1990s, it's happened in the US in the 2000s, that um, if, we, if we treat chronic non low back pain with opioids, what's the first thing that happens? Every drug addict in the place descends onto your service. Oh, well, it's all low back pain. And we can't tell. So if, we, if we're going to keep our service from being uh, closed down because we're a supply of opioids to the community, we have to be very firm. Otherwise, the, all the addicts descend on your service. And the same applies if you're GP. If you're a GP and you're too flexible with your use of opioids for chronic low back pain, you'll soon find yourself <coughs> with letters from the Ministry of Health saying, you know, you're way outside the guidelines in terms of numbers of patients of yours who are on opioids. Anyway, so that, that's our opioid guidelines. And, and if you adhere to that, it keeps you and your patients out of a lot of problems. Okay, so opioid contract um, with the patient. So what you say to me, this is a trial. Because patients had, uh, um, sometimes patients say, you started me on opioids, you're obliged to keep going with it. And they said, no, we start as a trial. If you do start as a trial, if it's not effective, it'll be stopped. So starting on a patient on morphine doesn't morally oblige you to continue with it. Now, addicts will not take that view. They will think you are morally obliged to keep them on it. Secondly, second principle, really important. You say, whose prescription is it at the bottom of the file, of the bottom of the prescription chart? It's yours. You're the prescriber. You're the one who's in, 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 told by, empowered by the state to prescribe this stuff. So no one tells you what to prescribe. <laughs> you make the decision. Um, thirdly, any evidence of diversion or abuse, you stop. The drug will be stopped if you're abusing it. Now, effectiveness normally needs an objective measure. It doesn't e.g. improve function. So, and we get patients who say, oh, the opioids are really effective, but it's not quite good enough and I still can't get out of bed. Um, I'm still in agony, disabled, so I need more. Now, that's not evidence that's effective. The patient will say it's useful, it's effective, but it's not being manifested in their behaviour. So that is not evidence of efficacy and it's not grounds for perpetual dose increase. That's the way you get from no morphine to 2,000 milligrams of morphine in five years' time. It's by every time giving in to that, 10 milligrams, fifth principle, 100 milligrams of morphine, or you can set the line in the sand wherever you like. Uh, uh, the, um, the US guidelines currently about 50 milligrams a day or 90 at a maximum morphine milligrams of morphine daily equivalent will not be exceeded because of the risks and lack of efficacy. No replacements for lost, eaten, stolen, or transmigrated scripts. And all the stories we all hear, you know, the dog ate it or, or the whatever. Uh, random urine drug screens, what to see what is and what isn't present. Um, and one prescriber, one dispensing pharmacy. So this is about keeping yourself and your patients safe and allowing you to stay in practice. Because <laughs> if, you, if you don't do this, uh, you'll find the Ministry of Health will be on your tail. Now, here, some fallacies, and they're implicit and they're subconscious, that it drive the opioid prescribing and the dose escalating. Um, and this, this is the first one. All else fails, use morphine. Because why? Well, it's our strongest analgesic. It's our gold standard. But that's wrong. As we've seen, it's not first-line treatment in chronic pain. It is helpful for severe nociceptive or inflammatory pain, post-operative, post-traumatic, and in terminal malignant pain, but it is not the gold standard for neuropathic or nociceptive pain. It's not the final thing you go to if everything else fails in chronic pain, okay? It is for these things, but not in chronic pain. Related to that is the belief, and I call it nociceptive fundamentalism. The notion, that, the, the notion that the nociceptive system alone of any bodily system is infallible. Okay, we can get heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, skin disease, joint disease, but for some reason, the nociceptive system is exempt from failure. If, you, if, 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 if you've got pain in your back, you must have something wrong with your back. Okay, that's nociceptive fundamentalism. Believing the nociceptive system can never go wrong. So, if you've got pain in your back, it must be nociceptive inflammatory pain because that's the only sort of pain there is. The pain is always telling you the truth. So morphine must be effective. Why? Because the gold standard in these forms of pain. Um, okay, nociceptive exceptionalism or fundamentalism. But the nociceptive system is not an exception. But like every other organ system, it can malfunction, mislead. So it must not always be read literally, which is fundamentalism. Uh, in chronic primary pain, pain does not mean pathology. Uh, and the, the next fallacy that drives morphine is the belief that there must be a solution to this. I've got awful pain. You mean you can tell you try to tell me we can put people on the moon and you can't do something for my pain? I say, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. 
but and, and and it's the fairy tale myth. They all lived happily ever after. There's for every human's problem, there's a, there's a solution. Well, there's not. Um, in the real world, we have to deal with the problem of evil. <laughs> okay, evil exists, and it's, a, it's an ongoing problem. Unfairness uh, and nastiness is part of life, and pretending that it's not. That there's a solution to all human problems is what drives the, the, the ongoing prescription of opioids. So now, this is a really crowded slide. I'm sorry about this, but you can look at it later if you like. But deprescribing opioids. Now, this is, this is a good news story, OK? You, remember, you heard it here today for the first time. You probably all heard it here for the first time. But, so the issue is, and it's come to light in the US in the last 10, 15, 20 years with the escalating numbers of opioid prescriptions and unintentional deaths. Question, what happens when someone who's on long-term opioids for chronic pain, what happens when you stop their opioids? Now, common sense would say, and the patient will certainly tell you, how can you possibly think of stopping my opioid? Because I'm in severe pain despite being on 500 milligrams of morphine a day. And you want to stop it, okay? Very common sense. How on earth do you deal with that? Well, there's some data to show what happens, okay? Now, first up here is a review. Oh, God. Here's a review from the Mayo Clinic in June 2015. They reviewed what happens when you get people long-term opioids for chronic pain off their opioids. And these are all quotations. Many patients fear that their pain will increase during an opioid taper, deprescribing. However, according to studies of long-term opioid treatment tapers, overall, patients report improvements in function. What? <laughs> report improvements in function without associated worsening in pain. That's very odd, isn't it? Um, that in a thousand patients, they got no worse pain, but gets in 500 got improved pain. We talked before about opioid induced hyperalgesia. So, one third of the patients on long term opioids, their pain actually got better when you got, got them off the opioids. Okay, convincing evidence, says this review of Mayo Clinic, from an aggregate population of 1520, that's 1007 plus 513, suggests stable two thirds or improved one third pain after an opioid taper. Although short-term withdrawal can lead to transitory increased pain and hyperalgesia, okay? So this is really important news, <laughs> okay? Um, now, the next year, Pain Medicine published a study, 159 patients, consecutive, again admitted to the Mayo Clinic um, from 20, 2006 to 2012 with fibromyalgia. And they were completing a three-week outpatient interdisciplinary pain rehabilitation program, like we run at Burwood. Now, of that 159 patients, 55 or 35 percent were using daily opioids. So what happens when these people were withdrawn from the opioids? Patients on daily opioids had a morphine equivalent dose of 99 milligrams a day. That's a yeah, reasonable dose, average of 100 milligrams a day. Now, patients on less than 100 milligrams a day were tapered off over only 10 days. It's not over two years, it's 10 days. Patients on more than 200 milligrams a day were tapered off over a mean of only 28 days. Now, withdrawal symptoms were not significantly statistically different for those based on their mean dose or the duration of opioid use. So neither dose nor duration predicted severity of withdrawal symptoms. The way it gets better. Patients had significant improvements in pain-related measures, including numeric pain scores, depression, catastrophizing, health perception, interference with life, perceived life control at the end of the program. So these people did better off their opioids despite stopping up. Then the study concluded fibromyalgia patients on high doses of opioids were tapered off over a longer period of time, but no difference in withdrawal symptoms were based on opioid dose or duration of opioid use. Um, despite opioid tapering, pain-related measures improved at the completion of the rehabilitation program. Um, and there's another review published in Annals of Internal Medicine, July last year. Oh, my God, this is hopeless. My finger's too fat. <laughs> um, so they looked at 67 studies. So the, the, the name of the systematic review is Patient Outcomes in Dose Reduction or Discontinuation of Long-Term Opioid Therapy. Systematic review, okay? July 2017. They found 67 studies, 11 were randomised trials, uh, randomised to opioid withdrawal or to not to opioid withdrawal, and 56 were observational. They examined eight intervention categories, including interdisciplinary pain programs, buprenorphine-assisted dose reduction, or behavioural interventions. They found 40 studies examined patient outcomes after dose, after dose reduction. 
Improvement was reported in pain severity in eight out of eight studies. In other words, those studies that looked at pain severity, all eight showed an improvement in pain. In those that looked at function, all studies showed improvement in function. In those that looked at quality of life, uh, studies only three, they all found improved quality of life. And I've got at the bottom there some other studies published this year and late last year <coughs> on the effect of opioid withdrawal on people in chronic pain. They all showed the same thing. <laughs> Paradoxically, and your patients won't believe a word of it, but you've got the data there. Pain, if anything, improves or does not worsen when you get them off chronic opioid therapy for their chronic pain. Really important. Now, the exception, of course, is people with addiction. Addicts aren't going to buy into this. They're not going to like this at all. They should, but they should be under an addiction service, not a chronic pain service. Question? Right. Now that, yeah. yeah. So those, those studies are in the context of uh, these patients have a Pain not all were. Good question. Some were, but, but, but not all were right. in that context. There were different treatments uh, and support available, but good question. Yeah. Mm. But it's not just in the context of an intensive interdisciplinary team. Yeah. Primary. Yeah. Some were just withdrawn in their doctor's clinic. Really, there's a safety to be prescribed in, a, you know, in a, some of the isolated areas in the country. Yeah, know, yeah. Some of the studies specifically, they looked at outpatient primary care opioid withdrawal. Oh. And they had good results mm. as well. Okay, so this is important stuff. John, now, one more question. Okay. One more question. Hi. Hi. Um, the short-term withdrawal effects. How long was the period that people would be dealing with that? It, the way I explain it, it, it's. So someone, you know, I've seen people on more than 2,000 milligrams a day of morphine. Mm -hmm. Now, the way, the way they get there, no one sets out to be malicious or nasty or anything, but they, everyone sets off with the best of intentions. So they start off on five, yeah, they try everything else, nothing works, so they start off on, they're given five milligrams of morphine. The patient comes in a week later, oh, much better. The patient feels good. Doctor gets positive reinforcement, behavioural reinforcement. So the, a week later, the patient comes in and says, that good effect is now worn off, and I'm, I'm back to the way I was. So the doctor gives 10 milligrams, and over two or three years, they increase like that. Now what I say to the patient is, that's how you got there to get back, we've got to run that film in reverse. So you remember every time the dose went up, you initially felt better for a few days. Well, when you come down, every time the dose is decreased, you'll initially feel worse for a few days. But then you'll end up the same pain you were on the slightly higher dose. So it's a, it's, it's a few days, it's a few days, it's, it's not long term. It's very short term, yeah. Uh, okay, now we come on to the next controversial issue, of cannabis, okay? <laughs> On which, uh, anyway, um, so this was most recently reviewed in the published review um, uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine in September last year, 5th September 2017. And there were two systematic reviews. Um, one was on pain, one was on PTSD. I'll just concentrate on the pain systematic review here. Uh, it's called The Effects of Cannabis Amongst Adults with Chronic Pain and an Overview of General Harm. Systematic review. Okay. Now, for neuropathic pain, they found 13 randomised trials uh, to examine the effects of cannabis-based preparations on central or peripheral neuropathic pain. Now, their conclusion, I'll put in bold the important word, low strength evidence that cannabis may alleviate symptoms in some patients. Not a ringing endorsement, is it? Okay, it doesn't fill you with confidence that this is God's answer to, to chronic pain. Um, so it's it's pretty, pretty weak, isn't it? Across nine studies, intervention patients were more likely to report at least a 30% improvement in pain. This is in neuropathic pain, okay? Neuropathic pain. Most studies were small, few reported outcomes beyond two to three weeks, very short term, and none reported long-term outcomes. Now in MS, a central neuropathic pain, nine RCTs, they, they conclude there was insufficient evidence to characterise the effect of cannabis on patients with, M with MS, okay? Now, what about other forms of pain? That's neuropathic pain. Some evidence in, in peripheral neuropathic pain. In cancer pain, they found three RCTs. There was insufficient evidence because of the small number of studies and their methodological limitations. Insufficient evidence for cancer, for cannabis in cancer. But we hear that on the news every day. <laughs> cannabis is a solution to everyone with terminal cancer pain, isn't it? And we're being really nasty to prevent them accessing it. Okay, then what about other pain conditions? Because neuropathic pain is uncommon in a pain service. Most patients we see do not have neuropathic pain. They have chronic musculoskeletal pain, chronic visceral pain, headaches. So what about those? Well, this review published in September last year, two RCTs and three cohort studies of cannabis-based preparations on, on pain in patients with other or mixed conditions, fibromyalgia, inflammatory abdominal pain, 
they found insufficient evidence because of inconsistent results and the paucity of methodological rigorous studies. So the overall results from this review, low strength evidence that cannabis alleviates neuropathic pain, insufficient evidence in other pain populations. It's not the solution to chronic pain, regardless of what you hear on the news media. What about the harms? And let systematic reviews, increased risk of motor vehicle accidents, psychotic symptoms, and short-term cognitive impairment. Okay, now the accompanying editorial to that, a few quotes there, um, states, quote, these two systematic reviews highlight an alarming lack of high quality data from which to draw firm conclusions about the efficacy of cannabis for these conditions, for which cannabis in the US is both sanctioned and commonly used. A lot of states have got laws for medicinal cannabinoids, for God's sake. <laughs> and they're saying, where's the evidence base for that? Well, there's a lack of high quality data. In terms of the pain systematic review, not the PTS review, in other words, the editorialists conclude there's limited, low strength evidence that cannabis alleviates neuropathic pain and insufficient evidence for other types of pain. There you've got it, okay? These conclusions, the editorialist goes on to state, seem at odds with the fact that pain is one of the most common medical conditions for which cannabis use is used and approved in many states. So they say, why the discrepancy? Why the gap between the evidence and the practice? Okay, we go. Oh, the largest clinical trial that this review looked at, 28% of participants randomised to the cannabis, cannabinoid, showed a clinical response, 16% randomised to placebo. So that's the difference. 28% randomised to cannabis, 16% randomised to placebo. <coughs> So most patients randomised to cannabis didn't get a therapeutic effect. So the conclusion um, from the editorialist was there's little high quality evidence from which to draw firm conclusions about the efficacy of cannabis and cannabinoid products for treating pain and PTSD. Okay, and yet we're faced with a um, uh, demands for this to be legalised. Um, so then there's another systematic review which is currently in the process being published in, in Pain, the world's leading pain journal. Um, and it was commissioned by the uh, federal government in Australia of Australia's National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. That's combined between universities of Queensland and New South Wales. So they were asked to do review for the Australian government the uses of cannab cannabinoids in every medical condition which has been suggested. They searched for studies of cannabinoids in all indications. The most studied indication is chronic nominal pain. Pain, but again, as we've seen, it's heavily biased to neuropathic pain, which is not the most common form of chronic pain. Uh, they identified 89 publications, uh, 24 were randomised con uh, parallel randomised control trials, 23 were crossover trials, and 53 observational studies. Now, the review of cannabinoids in chronic pain, half of them were for neuropathic pain, which is not the most common form of chronic pain seen. Eight out of 89, that was less than 10%, with fibromyalgia. One in 89 was with rheumatoid arthritis. Of those 89 studies, 14 were high quality. Okay, this is not very good. 14 high quality. Um, the overall headline result was there was moderate strength evidence that cannabinoids were just better than placebo in achieving a 30% reduction in neuropathic pain. Just better than placebo. Moderate evidence. Okay, now here we go. Remember we talked about the number needed to treat for for gabapentin and venlafaxine and tricyclics? You thought they were bad, but you wait till you see this. The number needed to treat for 30% pain reduction in any cannabinoid was 22. For a 30% pain reduction, 22 patients with a cannabinoid in these trials before you get one patient with a, 30, uh, with a miserable 30% reduction in their pain. Number needed to treat for 50% pain reduction was 26. Okay, you thought gabapentin was bad. This is much worse. <laughs> The number needed to harm for any adverse event was six. Serious harm was 71. And, they, they, and uh, for, non, for specific non-neuropathic pain conditions, musculoskeletal pain, like low back pain, fibromyalgia, and neck pain, migraine, headache, visceral pain, there was little or no evidence to guide therapy. It is not going to be <laughs> the solution to the world's chronic pain problems. It's delusional to think it is. Okay, so I've only looked at the most two recent systematic reviews, but I prepared this slide for when I was looking at um, um, 
more. The next uh, big pressure though will be a big farmer pressure. Say again? The guys, the next big pressure will be a big farmer pressure. Yeah. Um, for GPs and others to yeah. entertain the nonsense. Mm. The guy with the big warehouse and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Oh. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so I, I, I'd actually looked at four recent systematic reviews since June 2015. I won't look at here today the last two, but it, from all of them, there's weak evidence for cannabinoids in neuropathic pain, no or insufficient evidence in chronic muscular pain, headache, chronic visceral pain, or cancer pain. Few and low quality studies providing insufficient evidence to gain. So, the American journals consistently comment this would not qualify, this would not get through the FDA standards. Any other drug is expected to get through the FDA standards, not cannabis. Interesting. And then there's the issue of side effects. Now, I, I just want to take us. We still got time, Ron? You've got five minutes. Ah, this is, so I want to deviate a little bit. You probably all know this, but talking a little bit about acute pain here, analytics of acute pain. So, this was a review published in 2012 in the journal Pain. Now, this is based on studies of acute pain in humans, so, and it's clinical pain. It's not experimental pain, nor is it pa pain in animals. This is, the model used is third molar extraction. Very sort of destructive and painful procedure, okay? What's their best, what's the best analgesic for pain following third molar extraction? Ibuprofen, 200 milligrams, and paracetamol, 500 milligrams. Number I'm needed, hi. I'm just saying we've been on old maximofacial practice, and that's probably 80% of our work. And we prescribe exactly that. Okay, well, it's evidence based treatment you're doing. <laughs> the number needed to treat is less than two. So, more than 50% of patients you give this will achieve, look at this, at least 50% pain relief over four to six hours. But look what you can, this is astonishing when I saw this, I couldn't believe it. Look at what it's compared to. There's oxycodone, 10 milligrams. Number needed to treat nearly four. And here you've got tramadol, 75 milligrams. Number to treat again, nearly four. Codeine, 60 milligrams, number needed, plus paracetamol, number needed to treat nearly, oh, nearly four. So, so it, this is the most effective analgesic for acute pain in humans. It's not even 400 of, of, of ibuprofen and 1,000 of paracetamol, it's 500 of paracetamol and 200 of ibuprofen. This is really good news. But if you treat people with acute pain with this, you avoid getting them onto the opioid roundabout. We use um, real patients, assuming they're all over the world. We do two tablets of that, so they're actually Four hundred and a gram. Okay, okay. And yeah. But with the evidence you only need to use one of each. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now and most recently, another test of this was this was published in JAMA last uh, last November. Um, seven November twenty seventeen. This was a study or where this is a study in in two emergency departments in the Bronx in New York. And they looked at people presenting there, four hundred odd patients with acute severe extremity pain. In other words, the average pain intensity was 8.7 out of 10. Okay, we're not talking about mild pain, we're talking about people presumably with, with traumatic limbs. Uh, they randomised 104 to each of four groups. All of them were combined with paracetamol. It was either 400 milligrams ibuprofen or one of three opioids. And the outcome was no different. So in an acute setting in ED with human severe limb pain, Paracetamol combined with ibuprofen was as effective as paracetamol combined with an opioid. Yeah? Was the pain relief given after the process or before in anticipation of the pain in this study? This study here? No, just the one before. I was just wondering if that makes a difference. Do you, do you treat your, I, I don't know from this, do you, do you treat your patients given paracetamol and ibuprofen before the extraction no, or after? No, no, no. So it's after the extraction. Because you would before putting an IUD. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just wondering. Out, out the so. Yeah. A lot of this is a trauma. Say again? I thought there wasn't a lot of it done in trauma as well. This study. This study? Yeah, the the, 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 yeah this, this study will be tra trauma patient, presumably most of them. Uh, acute, severe, extremity pain. So, so the outcome, all of those treatments had good pain relief. Um, but ibuprofen combined with paracetamol was just as effective as opioids combined with paracetamol. So, if you can avoid treating acute pain with opioids, which you can by using, I've not seen studies on other anti-inflammatories, I've only seen them on ibuprofen combined with paracetamol. I don't know if it applies to diclofenac or naproxen, the studies are on ibuprofen. If you're going to do evidence-based practice, you use ibuprofen plus paracetamol. The problem with ibuprofen and three months royalty now is that the age that you can get the recommended 
don't take the part like for 60, 60 years and over now, what we can be really useful. But, but this is short term, this is very short term. But even short term, they're saying. Yeah. Um, less than a week. Yeah. Less than a week. Less than a week. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah